hey, we're going to do a show about Windows. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> do you do you mean to say that they finally <laughs> announced that they're going to release Windows 9? Wait a minute. Where did I see this? Hold on. Uh, wait, wait, no, wait. they didn't. But there was wow. a great Twitter post. Uh, try to find it. And then we'll start the show, I promise. Okay, I'm not going to be able to find it, am I? Um, Microsoft... Uh, Microsoft has sent a clear message today that they will continue to make new versions of Windows and offer them for sale. <laughs> it says Casey it's Newton. It's much more, much more exciting than that. <laughs> it is, actually. Actually, there's some cool stuff in here. All right, you guys ready? Yep. The Daily Tech News Show with Tom Merritt is funded by patrons like you and me. Each month, I pledge one dollar. Being British, I had no idea what a dollar was. So I stayed up for hours researching and discovered that it is about 62 pence. To pledge 62p, or perhaps even more, go to patreon.com slash acedetect. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, September 30th, 2014. That part of my script was covered. I'm Tom Merritt. Joining me today, Molly Wood, columnist for the New York Times. Welcome Hello. to the show, Molly Wood. Happy to be here. Thank you for joining us. Also, Patrick Beja, host of La Rendezvous Tech and regular contributor to DTNS. How's it going, Patrick? Woohoo! It's going excellent. I'm fresh off the plane and ready to rock Windows. Wow. Wow. <laughs> you, you really do sound excited. He's I, stoked. I, He's fired up. Listen, I must have been one of the only people in in the world, I'm not afraid to say, who enjoyed Wind who enjoys Windows 8. So, I'm happy to hear what they have next uh, if in store for us. All right, we're going to get to what they announced about Windows 9 right away in the headlines. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knows Microsoft announced the next version of Windows will be called Windows 10 and be released sometime late in 2015. Windows 10 will be one platform and app store across phones, tablets, laptops, and desktops. More information on those universal apps will come at the Build Conference in April 2015. Among the new features, Microsoft confirmed the Start menu will return in Windows 10, and tiled apps will be allowed to run in a windowed mode, as they showed off at Build last April. A technical preview will be released starting tomorrow, and if you want to get that, you got to go to preview.windows.com. And also, you're not counting wrong. They skipped nine. Yeah, that's right. eBay announced Tuesday it will spin off PayPal into a separate, publicly traded company in the second half of 2015. Carl Icahn, the activist uh, investor, has been encouraging the company to do so. And by encouraging, I mean arm twisting. Uh, but who is in charge after the split? eBay's current CEO, John Donahoe, will step down. Dan Schulman, recently of American Express, will take over as CEO of PayPal. And Dave Wenig, who leads the eBay Marketplace division, will become CEO of eBay. Look for PayPal to start making some moves to take on Apple Pay. Yeah, I, that's kind of the argument here, right, is the flexibility for PayPal to compete across platforms or even work with Apple Pay without eBay saying, well, we'd really rather you do eBay stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, usually ICANN's uh, arm twisting, which he's famous for, uh, get uh, lukewarm responses from many people. But in this case, I don't think anyone thinks it's, it's not a good idea to separate I, the, good com the two companies. So. I think it's very smart and it lets PayPal, I mean, we are headed for a platform war between Apple mm -hmm. and PayPal and potentially Amazon over payments. Um, and it could get a little frustrating from the consumer side. I think what we're really about to find out is whether eBay has any future at all as a standalone business. Mm -hmm. PayPal makes yeah. up like 40 or more percent of their revenue, I think. Yeah, it makes up a big chunk of it. And don't forget, Carl Icahn pushed for this in January and they shut him down. Yeah. Like until today, it was like, nope, we're not doing what you say, Carl Icahn, at all. And then today, it's we're gonna do pretty much exactly what you asked us to do back in January, Carl Icahn. Well, I have to wonder if he fired up the PayPal people and if PayPal thought eBay were to take. Maybe possibly. Well. And Gadget reports Apple has announced the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus will go on sale in China on October 17th. Apple received the license to sell their phones earlier Tuesday. Pre-orders for the phone uh, in China will start October 10th. The phones will support TD LTE and FDD LTE, meaning 4G speeds on China Mobile, China Telecom and China Unicom. And with that, with that report on the New York Times yesterday about the... Uh, black gray market sellers complaining 
I'm wondering what the sales are going to look like once this goes official. Hmm. I've got a movie riddle for you. When is a sequel also a first? As you ponder all the... I know the answer. Yeah. Well, is it because you're reading the headline? Yes, it is. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I also looked ahead. <laughs> you guys are so smart. Part of the test was learning to look ahead in the lineup. As you ponder all the possible answers to that question, the New York Times has theirs. Netflix and the Weinstein Company are teaming up to make Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, The Green Legend become the first movie to have a major theatrical release and a Netflix release on the same day. The movie will not only be released in IMAX theaters, not traditional theaters, so it's not quite the full cord killer dream come true, but Netflix's chief content officer, Ted Sarandos, said he hoped this will be a proof point that the sky doesn't fall, said theater owners. Sky's falling! <laughs> Baby steps. Yeah, they did. Spotted at, pa at Paris Fashion Week, the Apple Watch. Apple Insider reports that Apple design chief Johnny Ive took his Switzerland terrorizing watch to Paris and introduced it to the likes of Vogue editor Anna Wintour and Chanel's Karl Lagerfeld at hip Parisian boutique Colette. Mere mortals were also briefly allowed to view the Apple Watch as well, making it the first time that Apple's wearable has been seen by the general public. I, for one, would give my left ear to see Anna Wintour's unvarnished opinion of the Apple Watch <laughs> because I am here to tell you I like jewelry, and that thing is ugly. <laughs> it is ugly. The big one is ugly. Well, the small one is ugly. It's ugly. Yeah. There, 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 there aren't a lot of people who are fawning over the watch, it seems. But uh, there were people queuing two to three hours to just look at it through a, a, a window, you know, through a pane of glass. They couldn't even touch it or try it on. Um, so, yeah, it's not quite that exciting, God, actually. I'm you can get a better view of it in... Uh, <laughs> We'll see, we'll see. Ugly. Um, Recode reports Intel-owned Basis announced a new watch called Peak, or The Peak. <laughs> the Peak counts your steps, measures your heart. Is it your heart or your heartbeat? I guess <laughs> your heartbeat, <laughs> probably. <laughs> right, so right. actually give you, give you <laughs> centimeters. Like this big, it's like this big. <laughs> His heart grew two sizes <laughs> for real. About the size of a fist. <laughs> and does some smart watch stuff like phone notifications using Bluetooth LE. It also claims four days of battery life and is waterproof. It's made of anodized aluminum uh, with a Gorilla Glass 3 face and comes in mate black, brushed silver, and that's it. <laughs> the watch works with iOS and Android, starts at $200, and will ship starting in early November. May Until also be ugly. Not sure. May, well, it might be better looking than the Apple Watch. I'm just it is ugly. <laughs> uh, Reuters reports that outgoing U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder expressed concern about data encryption that allows you, the data's owner, to be the only one who can unlock it. In a speech to the Global Alliance Against Child Sexual Abuse Online, Holder said, quote, it is fully possible to permit law enforcement to do its job while still adequately protecting personal privacy. And that quick access to phone data can help law enforcement officers find and protect victims such as those targeted by kidnappers and sexual predators. Right. So it is fully possible to permit law enforcement to do its job while still adequately protecting personal privacy. We've I'd noticed. be very interested in, in uh, finding out exactly how this is fully possible. It's um, adequate. Adequate. Right. Okay. This I mean, is like I, I, a total you reap what you sow situation because even if they have yeah. a point, we are past the point of trusting exactly. the government because they have gone so far that out of bounds. True. I mean, so do, 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 would, do, would you feel comfortable if the police had a master key to all of the houses in your neighborhood? Right. Ma that's the, the difference kind of the is, though, I do. I, I, there has been a lot of uh, debate about all of this in the past few days, and I'm not going to go over it. But I do want to point out one thing which was left out of many of the debates I've heard, which is this is not exactly like a safe or a house or anything like that, in that with these encrypted uh, devices, there is no way that you can get access to it. Right. It, it's completely impossible to get access to those things, even, if, you know, you can't uh, push down the, the door or anything like that. So there's a, a little bit of a difference. I think that there's a lot of wiggle room, though, around impossible when it comes uh, yeah. to encryption. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, all, eventually all encryption gets broken. First of all, I guess so. mm -hmm. uh, and second of all, there are some pretty darn good safes out there, uh, you know, and the mm -hmm. only way I would say that no safe is uncrackable is the same way I would say no encryption is uncrackable. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I guess if if someone if there's a kidnapping situation and the person is somewhere that you don't know, um, then you also have to do basically the encryption of getting the guy to tell you where they are. So there's a similarity yeah. there. It's like the good old days when they had to use police work. <laughs> Gum shoes. <laughs> Uh, Mac bites points out. No, wait, no. Recode oh, no, reports. Recode. recode reports that Reddit raised fifty million dollars in funding, which by itself is not huge news. But the interesting thing is that the round was led by Y Combinator president Sam Altman, who says he plans or would like to allocate ten percent of the equity to Reddit users. How that equity would be distributed. Or when is yet to be determined. Altman says that Reddit might consider doling out shares using a distributed accounting system, a la the Bitcoin blockchain. The details are pretty fuzzy yeah. here. Yeah, it makes everybody go, "Oh, is he going to put out a cryptocurrency?" Which maybe he would, or it could just be like mimicking Reddit the blockchain, could, like buy stuff from each other. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, mm-hmm. this is this. I mean, Reddit does take Bitcoin. Um, but you can't just put out shares as Bitcoin, right? Because they're shares. Right. They're, not, they're not Bitcoin. So um, it'll be interesting to see what they end up doing but, here. So basically, in, in essence, what they're going to do is distribute bits of Reddit to its users, which yeah. is, mm-hmm. well, oh, that's what they want to do. Right. I don't yeah. even know so if there wouldn't which be some... Which is very reddit and Yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. But there, there might be some regulations issues there as well, because... Yeah, I feel like... The technical side of this is fairly easy to come up with the rules that say, okay, Reddit users, here's the blockchain, go mine for your shares. But the the legal ramifications yeah. of that would sound almost impossible to me. Of course, mm-hmm. I don't know also do this. each Reddit user get like one bit of a of, of chain thing? So in in which case should we start creating tons of accounts to get lots of bits of Reddit? Or or start creating Beowulf clusters to mine our Reddit shares. <laughs> Possible. I, I already did that. Yeah. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> always beat me to the cluster. <laughs> Time now for some news from you. These are things from our subreddit at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. You don't have to have a, any kind of supercomputer of any kind. Uh, just go and visit it and you can vote on the stories that have been submitted, or you can even submit some of your own, like Metal Freak did. He posted the Lily Puting article that Google's Project Aura, the modular smartphone, will allow hot swapping of all the modules except for the CPU and the screen. Those two, if you swap them out, you'll have to reboot. A custom version of Google L lets you swap out your cameras, your sensors, even the battery without having to reboot. Now, presumably, if you only had one battery module and you took it out, it would lose power. But, you know, if you had two battery, or you take out the camera, put in a battery, pull out the dead battery, that could work hot swappable. Or maybe it's plugged in. Um, when or it's doing plugged that. in, yeah. A working model of Project Aura will be shown off at a developer's conference in December, and the phone is expected to launch in early 2015. This is like the longest launch lead-up ever, but I am excited to see it. Didn't we talk about, like, was it a prototype of this on Buzz Out Loud? <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> it's and they, been that long, about, right? Like, two CESs ago, at least. Yeah. There and was then, the uh, Phone Blocks uh, project, which right. is somewhat similar on, on uh, Kickstarter, I think, a couple yeah. of years ago. I think that ago. is this, actually. I think phone Blocks got required. subsumed into Project Aura. Yeah. Well, uh, they're working together. I'm not sure yeah. they got completely uh, eaten up. But they but brought anyway, those guys Aura in, is, I guess. I believe, as far as I understand, Aura is Phone Blocks. Mm, I don't think so. No. All right, well, mm. you can Google we'll that while I take this next blurb. <laughs> Moranthropology, I know it's Mr. Anthropology, but I just like to call him that, submitted the CNET article about Matchstick, a $25, H- a $25 HDMI streaming stick powered by Firefox OS. The device is open on the software and hardware side and is compatible with many existing Chromecast apps and hopes to have more apps from the Mozilla developers created by launch time. Backers of the Matchstick Kickstarter can get the stick at a discount, it is unclear to me why you would want this over the Chrome cost, however. Wider selection of apps, potentially, and open source hardware, so you could like put it into other things even more easily. Are the only ad- those are the big advantages I could think of. But I already have my Chromecast and I love it. I named yeah. it Magic Cast because it works like magic. <laughs> and and if you already have a Chromecast, you're right. Like you probably don't need this. I this guess is- Google already knows what I'm watching, so that's a problem. Maybe that's ah, the privacy on. minded might want this. Yeah, that's a good point. Actually. Maybe yeah. it's it is it, it, it's powered powered by a Firefox OS, so maybe it will do other things that might be interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
And it will work with a lot of Chromecast apps, so it gives you Chromecast apps plus. Yeah, I mean, it is true that right now, if I want to cast anything from the web, it has to be via Chrome, which isn't yeah. always everybody's favorite thing. Right. Hmm. Um, phone blocks seems to be independent, uh, but they are working with uh, Project Ara, with the Google's, uh, Google's team. So I'm not sure exactly what happens there, but obviously... If when Ara comes out, I don't think many people are going to be paying attention to phone blocks, which was kind of hoping to. I know that Project Ara brought the phone blocks guys onto the team. Sure. So maybe that means that after Project Ara is launched, they can go back and do some Mm -hmm. some kind of competing version if they want or something. I don't know. Anyway, who knows? Also, apparently. Oh, sorry. Oh, please do. I was just getting way too into that story because apparently it was like (laughs) it was Motorola that launched Project Ara, but. Is that going to go with them when they are acquired by Lenovo? Or stay with no, Google? Project Ara is staying with Google. It's part of the research yeah. lab. That's the one little piece Back of Motorola, Motorola that, that Google kept yeah. is the research yeah. stuff. Yeah. Okay. All right. And MacBytes pointed out the Apple Insider story that Apple issued a patch late Monday to fix the, the shell shock vulnerability in OS X. OS X. OS X10. <gasps> That's what I said. The update fixes the security flaw in Bash for OS X Mavericks, Mountain Lion, and Lion. Users have to configure certain services for OS X to have been... Ver- Users would have had to configure certain services for OS X to have been vulnerable, vulnerable, but now even those users have a fix. I don't even know what we call that tense in English, to be honest. The would have had to, to have been. Would have had to, to have been. It's the past (laughs) totally messed up. It's super messed up. Is what that is. (laughs) And that's a look at the headlines. I'll call it Windows 1.0. If that makes you feel any better. <laughs> Windows Actually, low. Um, the bit, like the someone... bit, literally the biggest news about the new version of Windows is that they did not call it Windows 9. Those well, rascals. You know what? You know what? Well, so first of all, Mike Dan on, on Twitter said, they just count Windows in base 9. It just makes sense. Oh. Um, well, now they and, do. Just now, though. Yeah. Before and no. second of all, you right. know, it's... I think it okay. First of all, it's easy to make fun of, and I'm sure we're going to do a lot of that during <laughs> this discussion. Uh-huh. But just calling it Windows 10 is making it a bigger story. I mean, we're all talking about it so much. I think it gains them some mind share and some attention. I think there's a lot of people that are going to be aware that there's a new version of Windows coming out for just because of this that wouldn't have been aware of it otherwise. Yeah, and it, it is a fair point that what they call it doesn't, shouldn't really matter as much, but it is what everyone has latched on to. I mean, the first thing I was like, really? Windows 10? Like, you just go from 8 to 10? Like, it was it weird really enough dumb. to call something Vista or XP <laughs> or me, and then but to just like, now yeah, we're just going to skip a number. You know, whatever. <laughs> Windows 7, at least they had like a kind of convoluted argument that this was the seventh version, even though it arguably was not. Windows 10 doesn't even have a logic behind it. I think it's very interesting because for the consumers who are not paying attention to today's announcement and are not aware that there's a tech build and whatever and are just going to be shopping for computers in another year who have been nothing but angry about Windows 8 are going to mentally, I think, perceive a large distance between Windows 8 and Windows 10. And they might just be like, oh, you know, they've obviously fixed everything that was because they're already up to 10. Like, I must have missed 9. But 10 can't possibly be as bad as... I mean, I think there's like a whole wraparound marketing effort here. I think you're right because that that is kind of how they tried to explain it. Like, they made up the story that they did Windows 9 and it was so good that they couldn't release it which is just dumb. What? They did? Yeah, that was in the announcement. They're like, we tested Windows 9 and it was perfect, so we decided to just move on to Windows 10. (laughs) (laughs) It's kind of what you're saying. They want people to think like, oh, well, you know, this must be the even better version. They want people to perceive a huge distance, a huge difference between 8 and 10, I think. Uh, and 10 sa- sounds sexier for some reason. It does. Like, 9, nine is, like is a pretty limp number. or something. Yeah. Now, that sort of belies what's going on here, which is the return of the start menu. They were very intent on easing Windows 7 users' fear in, in the press conference today. Uh, they, they were talking about the start menu is back, and, and your taskbar works better, and the charms bar isn't going to pop up accidentally when you're down on the right side. 
they and I think they have some lo some some logic to their argument here, which was Windows 8 was really good for touch devices and not so good for desktop devices. Mm -hmm. Windows 7 was really good for desktop devices, not so good for touch devices. And in Windows 10, what they're trying to do is say we want one operating system that will be working really well on touch devices and desktop, and to be good on desktop, we have to bring this stuff back. But they're doing some smart things, which is if you switch, like you've got a hybrid, right? And you pull the, the, the screen off to make it a tablet, it will ask you, do you want to go to tablet keyboards. mode? The, um, the keyboard off. Well, yeah. Oh, right, sorry. Half sorry. empty, half Even, full. Yeah, okay. Uh, sorry, my bad. When you, when, you, when you change it, when you convert it into a tablet, it'll say, right. do you want to go to tablet mode? And if you do, from then on, when you click or tap, the start button, it will give you the tiled screen, which is what you want on a tablet. I think that is really smart. That's what they should have done in the first place. It's it smart is if it works. Yeah, no, I mean, it's definitely. I think I think they're they're doing a lot of things. This one included basically what they're calling this uh, continuum, which is which will remind some people about the continuity feature of uh, uh, iOS uh, 10 Mavericks and, uh, I'm sorry, OS 10 Mavericks and iOS 8, which makes the, the mobile and desktop devices work seamlessly together. And that's Apple's approach, which is to say, we have two completely separate uh, devices, two different ecosystems, and both of them are going to communicate. And the idea behind Windows 8 was to have one operating system that would actually uh, work in both cases. Obviously, it didn't work out as well as, as people might have hoped. But in this version, they're mm -hmm. making this one OS morph from one UI to the other in the different use cases. And, they, and that's what they're calling continuum. Right. And I think it might, it might work out. It, it really takes the learnings from Windows 8, which again, I don't think was as bad as people are saying it is, especially in the desktop mode. You don't really have to see the other mode uh, if you don't want to. But they're taking the learnings from that. And there was a lot of work in UI and and design and they're integrating it in a very in a much more uh, um, coherent way into that ecosystem and they're also making sure they made the point of this they're also making sure that people who are comfortable using windows 7 are not going to have to relearn the ui because all of the touch stuff is going to be completely obfuscated if you don't want it if, if you're on a desktop um, and that's obviously a, a big a very important aspect for the business customers which represent represents a, a big part of, uh, of Microsoft's user base, of Windows user base. I think there's some really, I, I mean, we'll have to wait and see how it works, but there's some compelling stuff in there, isn't there? I think it's an interesting philosophical, it, it's a really well-defined philosophical difference between the way that Apple is executing on desktop and mobile and the way that Microsoft is now claiming that it will finally, after all of these <laughs> years, consistently execute across devices. Um, and there is a potentially strong argument that if this continuum thing works well, if the navigation is familiar, that that will make sense to people. I would argue that one of the things that Microsoft has done over the years that has given them trouble is try to make, make their devices do too many things, right? Like turn the Xbox into a media streaming box and confuse the reason that you want the Xbox or make the Surface be both a tablet and a laptop and also a really expensive laptop, but not all the way a tablet. And like Microsoft tends to confuse its message. There is something really pretty simple about a desktop operating system and a mobile operating system and optimizing the experience individually and not asking one operating system to transition from one to the other. And so if, because I don't always trust Microsoft to pull that off, I'm a little nervous about how this hat trick is going to go. But if it leads to familiarity and comfort across devices, that's kind of positive too. And let's be honest, like more people are going to have desktops than are going to have Windows mobile devices anyway. So <laughs> it might not be that much of a big deal for that many people. Well, well yeah, it, it, it kind of almost makes it more of a problem of the, f of the form rather than the function, right? Because the form is hard to pull off as well. Yeah. It is. But the thing is, if let's be honest, I think we all want one device that functions as in all of these use cases. I mean, ultimately, let's say it is possible. I think we'd be happier having devices that 
morph depending on how we want to use them, which is ultimately what they're trying to do. They're, because in reality, they still have the different uh, UI metaphors for touch and for desktop. It's just that one uh, of them is prevalent when you're using it in a different use case. Um, and if we can have the same device it might that we can use for all of those different things and it adapts to our uses, I think that's a, a very interesting approach. And given one of the issues that we had before was the fact that the, the file system in itself would be separated between the two very often because of the, you know, the apps would be uh, sandboxed and all of that. Mm -hmm. Now with the, the cloud, you don't really have that problem as much. You have a synced folder and it all works synchronized with the cloud and it doesn't really matter if you're, you know, if you have different file systems here and there. So... It, I think there's, it doesn't mean that it's completely, as they're saying, you know, one Windows, it's the same Windows for everything. That's not exactly true, I think. It's two different, or maybe even three different systems, because it is also the, the Windows that's going to power the Xbox One, for example. It is different OSs, but they just integrate really well in the way they relate to files. So you can use equivalent apps on the different metaphors to mani manipulate your, 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 you know, your, the documents you're working on. Um, and they're morphing from one UI to the next, effectively one OS to the next, um, depending on the use case. I don't think they're, because of all the work they've done with Windows Phone and Windows 8, I don't think they're far off from actually being able to pull it off. And if they can do it with Windows 10, heck, they, they'll just do it with, with, with Windows 11. You know? I, I think I, what Molly's they, identifying, uh, though, is that there's a, there's a definite mistrust that we developed under the Balmer years of being told that this is absolutely going to do what you want, and then it doesn't. Right. And sure. so this time, I think, I think Microsoft has identified that too, because they were very careful to say, we know you wanted to be able to run tiled apps in Windows. We're doing that. We know you've for decades wanted to control V directories into the command prompt, and we're going to risk <laughs> the, uh, the mocking of the world by showing that off in the command prompt. In this, I mean, they were very focused on, we're listening to you and we're trying to add this. And that's that technical preview that's coming tomorrow is, please help us test this out. We're going to make this available much earlier than we ever had in a wider range than we ever had. And this goes along with what Phil Spencer has been doing at Xbox, saying we're listening to you and we're adapting. We're, I think they really are trying to win that trust. The question that Molly rightly brings up is, will they? Will they yeah. actually execute on it? Can they execute? And, you know, I mean, I think there's an interesting question. I think we are at a point where we are ready to have a really serious conversation about what we want from operating systems, what we as consumers want from operating systems. Like from my perspective, I want it to go away. I want it to be essentially invisible. I realize, like I switched, I, I, it is unfair for me really to talk very much about Windows because I don't use it. I, I've been on Macs for years. Part of the reason was because I realized that I was software, I am OS agnostic because I live in a browser mm -hmm. and because I live in the cloud. And so I don't, I'm not as interested in software. I don't want there to be like a platform war. I don't know that I want my desktop to act just like my mobile device. I'll do it, though I, wouldn't it be great if I could just like reset all settings the way I can on my mobile device on my Mac? You know, I mean, I think there are certain behaviors that I want to carry over that are different use cases from where I might want, what I might want in a workplace desktop. And I think that Windows, that, you know, some of that still matters. I do understand the argument that there could that it would be great to have like a file structure on an iPad, but personally I don't need it. And so yeah. there's there's a question. So I think Microsoft is trying to answer the question about what people want their OS to do for them and where. Maybe it will be easier to maintain one code base too by just having sort of one operating system and and not splitting resources. I don't know. I'm just really curious to see how this is going to execute and how often. I think some of that stuff about Continuum is like sexy to show off, but I, I suspect that that's not what people are going to use very often. That's like a limited audience of like yoga. 
I surface. Think, user. Yeah, and I, I think that's going to mm-hmm. show its best advantage, not in the hybrid situation, but in the fact that I can have Windows 10 on my tablet and never notice that it's also got this weird desktop portion, like the Surface RT had when it launched, yeah. which is just odd, mm-hmm. and the vice versa. My Windows 8 machine does have that tiled interface where I'm like, this is obviously for a touchscreen, and I don't have a touchscreen. If that just goes away, and if you just don't notice... You don't notice. That's, that's the win for that. If it is actually invisible, but it's familiar across devices, and it compels you enough to want to use those devices that are familiar, like you see a Windows tablet or you see a Windows phone and you're not sort of put off by how it's slightly different or doesn't seem to make sense, that could be a plus. Yeah. So I guess the question is indeed, do we actually need that thing that they're developing, which is a consistent core OS, or could they just keep going with different OS is, you know, one for the phone I and think tablet. I think they and one for... need it, and I think probably developers need it. Uh, I don't but think it still... matters whether we need it. I don't know. Though. You but... still have Google saying that they'll pursue as many operating systems as they want, or at least they have said that in the past with Chrome OS and Android. And, mm. and then you've got, which, you know, doesn't seem to be going anywhere because Google doesn't follow through, drink. Um, and you have Apple saying, as far as we're concerned, there are two operating systems, right? We're doing Yosemite for the desktops and we're doing iOS over here and we want them to be able to talk to each other, but they have completely different uses. So Microsoft is really forging like a solo path in some ways by saying we're going to have this one OS for all devices. So they're they're going it alone. They are charting a new course and, and it will be really interesting to see how it plays out. All right, let's check the calendar uh, real quick. Tomorrow's 4chan's birthday. 4chan will be 11 years old. And tomorrow is also Techmanity, a conference in downtown San Jose, which features speakers and panelists curated by Fast Company Magazine and networking and music events produced by Concert Powerhouse Live Nation. So, you know, it's another day in Silicon Valley. Runs through October 2nd. Our pick of the day is Windows 9. No, it's uh, no. Our pick of the day is archive.org. Uh, Alan Palmer said, like many of your listeners, I'm interested in the tech of podcasting itself, both as an aspiring podcaster and also out of technology interests. You host at archive.org, not an obvious choice one hears about often. Could you use archive.org as a pick and go through why you use it? Well, yes, Alan, I will. Um, I actually am not hosting Daily Tech News Show on archive.org anymore uh, because the show grew enough that that wasn't the optimal choice. But the reason I host all my other shows there is that under a certain threshold, archive.org is free. They want you to host your material there because it's their whole purpose is to collect all the information on the internet. So you're helping them out by storing it there. It's one less thing they have to go gather. Uh, and it uh, gives you all kinds of things like transcoding into AUG and some stats and, and cool, cool other side benefits of, uh, of nifty things. Like if you host a video there, it'll automatically turn it into a GIF, uh, for instance. So I, I just feel like when you're starting out especially and you need to keep costs down, it's a, it's a great place to go to. So that's my reasoning, archive.org. Send your picks to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com and you can find my picks at dailytechnewsshow.com slash picks. Our message of the day comes from Rich and Lovely Cleveland, who says, the primary problem I see with any social network trying to compete with Facebook, this is in response to our discussion about Elo, is that none of them are trying to change the metaphor of interaction. They're all essentially copying Facebook. The biggest thing Facebook ever did was put the feed up front, taking social network from being a page you maintained to draw your friends to look at in a much more passive and consumed experience. The problem that Path, Diaspora, Identica, and now Ello will have is that by emulating this same feed metaphor, all you are doing is serving people with an inferior version of Facebook with less content to lurk over. Path made the argument that people wanted a more meaningful feed with more quality interaction. Ello is making the argument that people don't want ads in their feed, but ultimately both are setting themselves to be inherently judged by the same standards of Facebook's feed and will almost certainly come up short. It's not to say that Elo can't be successful. You don't need to have a billion users to do that, but it's not setting itself up to supplant Facebook in any sense. I don't know how you shift the metaphor to engage users in a meaningful way, but Elo isn't it right now. Yeah, I, I don't know that that's... Oh, well, I don't, so there. Um, ah, <laughs> I guess, yes. You I, I, oh, you don't agree. How excellent. Yeah. <laughs> well, so basically, I, I kind of agree with what he is, uh, what, what, what you're saying, Rich, but I don't think that's exactly what Elo is trying to do. They're not trying to invent something different in the uh, metaphor. That what they're trying to do, just as Diaspora and Identica did, was play on the privacy and thus on the, on the business model. They're not trying to... to 
turn the users into you know piggy banks through advertisement they're trying to say we're going to make you pay for the service and thus you're not going to be uh, uh, advertised to the problem is diaspora and identica and a few others have failed because it seems that users do not want to use these services or at least not enough of them um to 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 make these services successful and that's the fundamental issue people don't want to pay for well most people don't want to pay for stuff on the internet right so the part and the part that i agree with is, is that it is similar to facebook in that very important way right in terms of content and i am not dissatisfied with the content in my facebook feed right so even if i have concerns about privacy or concerns about data gathering or concerns about the way they're doing behavioral targeting targeted truly targeted ads don't really bother me and all my friends are on facebook so it's right. any time you're the one combination of, device, of the two yeah you're sort of saying to you're saying to the casual user hey i really i know how you really like that super comfy armchair that you sit in every day but like look i set up this armchair right next to it it's almost as comfortable but it's like newer and a little bumpy and <laughs> it's that relative that buys you a gift to replace the thing you love <laughs> right you already have that thing and you like it so that you know for the casual user there's no incentive to go over there and try to like build right. up a new collection and then all of the people who are following me on elo and i love you and yeah. thank you are people who are not my friends. They're people who are techie and like, you know, like I'm sticking, Facebook is my mom network. Like I'm yeah. in and so I'm I guess they cool have, with it. I just, there's they no have two incentive. problems. They have two problems. Hello, they have the problem that they're too similar to Facebook to provide an incentive for people to go there and drove. Yes. And the bet that they're betting on, which is people are sick of the privacy issues, actually it doesn't matter to people they're betting that it does but it doesn't matter enough to people that they will jump off and they're That's doing funny. it at exactly the time that facebook is actually making although they're doing like all this sketchy behavioral targeting mm. stuff facebook is all of a sudden trying to help you out with your privacy yeah. like yeah. did you go and get the privacy audit they, yeah, they like, finally learn yeah. they, they're mm. defaulting to friends only for posts and they're actually making it sort of mean, you know, because they, they realize that people do care about privacy to some extent, but what they care about is having privacy in the place where all their friends already. My, my thing is, the, I, what amuses me is everyone compares Elo to Facebook, and I feel like Elo isn't anything like Facebook. I compare it to Twitter. Yeah. I feel like it's more like Twitter. Well, and it's exactly people, like Twitter because your default posts are all public. Right, How do you exactly. not realize that? Yeah. Oh. Uh, and and all of the Damn. people that are I'm fo I'm finding following me. For instance, I just got Kelvington is following you on Ello. Yeah. Kelvington's been following me on Twitter. We've been social network buddies for a decade now. Yeah. I mean, these are all, all the people. same people that were trying out Twitter and Pounce and Plurk. Like it feels like those days for Ello. Plurk. Uh, and what <laughs> I want. Yeah. Well, and that's why I'm like, okay, is this going to be Twitter? Is it going to find its its reason for being, or is it going to be Plurk or Pounce? And well, everybody and goes there and plays with it for a while and goes, well, I don't really know why I'm here, so back to the things I know. I know, plus I hate the interface and I can't figure out what to do. And Twitter has even less of an incentive, like there's even less incentive for me to leave Twitter. Yeah. Like Twitter's fine. I have zero issues with Twitter. And Ello so it has to give you something that says, oh, I can't do this other places, or, oh, yeah. I really like doing this in here, and this is where those people are. Yeah. And, and I agree I haven't seen that yet. with yeah. the central point that reinventing the feed metaphor, reinventing the feed concept might be the thing that differentiates enough to make us all use a different service. But it is true, true that at this point, and I just wrote last week's column was about this, like trying to figure out the perfect way to feed people information, the balance of what they want versus making money versus engaging them even when they don't, even when they think they're being manipulated. And they are all just variations on a feed. Well, don't miss those columns, people. Twitter.com slash Mollywood, or maybe Ello, but really Twitter.com slash... I'm not going to be there for, I'm slash... be there for long. Like, you know what? <laughs> I'm not going to be there long. <laughs> Twitter.com slash Mollywood, uh, Mollywood.com. Uh, and really, no, no, do not go to Mollywood.com. Oh, oh God, did I? I'm totally made that old mistake. <laughs> never, uh, do not ever go, to, go there. Don't ever go to Mollywood.com. That's not the, my site. Themolly.com. Themolly.com. And really where you want to go is nytimes.com slash machine learning. It's true. Although now at themolly.com, even better, there's a full RSS archive of everything that I write for the Times as opposed to just the machine learning column. So oh, fantastic. I That's great. I know. So I have a redesigned site and it's got like a... 
So do go to the Molly Dark. So go to the Molly. Do not go to Molly. I can't with believe that I said that. We'll explain That's... later. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Or if you do, use an incognito tab. Patrick Beja, <laughs> thank you so much uh, for for joining, especially because I know you just got right off a plane and it's late there in Paris. Twitter.com slash not Patrick. Uh, La Rendezvous Tech. Anything else uh, to let folks know about? Uh, no, not quite yet. Uh, notpatrick.com is the, the no, no, not notpatrick.com. Sorry. <laughs> well, actually, it just it just redirects to Patrick Beja. But not Patrick on Twitter is the easiest way to follow me, and uh, it's easy to remember. It's Patrick, but with a not in front of it. Excellent. Uh, don't forget uh, to thank our patrons uh, if you see them, or if you're one of them, thank yourself, 4,312 of them, willing to support the show, finding some value in the show. We super appreciate everything that people do from, from being a Patreon to, to making you know even a small one-time donation to just telling folks about the show or sending us those little intros that we play before the show. Uh, you guys are fantastic. DailyTechNewsShow.com slash donate. Uh, all the ways to support the show. Don't forget you can have a voice in what stories we cover. That's one way. DailyTechNewsShow.reddit.com Our email address is feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com Our phone number is 512-59-DAILY Our live show is at 4.30 Eastern, 1.30 Pacific on AlphaGeekRadio.com and our website is DailyTechNewsShow.com We'll be back tomorrow with Nicole Lee, Senior Editor of Social and Internet for Engadget. Talk to you then. It's like you're there. <laughs> you're a real fan. It's like you're there. I just realized that I forgot to be in the chat room, which is really too bad because we were saying something. Aww. Also, how am I not invited to this tech manity thing? Oh, I, I never. I mean, don't get me wrong. It sounds terrible. Molly, the picture, <laughs> the picture for Tech Manity has like a lot of people with their arms up, going "woo" in front of like brightly colored smoke oh, paint. I'm looking at it right now. You do not want to be there. I do not want to be there. <laughs> that it's is like, like uh, the I'm sure center it's quite of all fun. things opposed to what you are. It's you know that's funny too because just today I was looking at the website for Hardly Strictly Bluegrass, which is happening this weekend, which is the a big free concert in Golden Gate Park, and but I never, I almost never go because I have a, I do not, I'm not good with crowds. I'm not good with that at all. So the pictures on the front of the Hardly Bluegrass website are all of like throngs. It looks like that video <laughs> that the drone took of the Hong, Hong Kong protesters that's going around the internet uh, today. Uh -huh. like it looks just like that. And I'm like, yeah, no, I think we're just going to not do that. Yeah. We're gonna live stream that show. Like only, I'm like a, I'm telling you, the only good live comment. music anymore is like live music where it's like ten people in a place with like the best bluegrass guy ever that nobody knows about. And that is the definition uh, of the about, problem of live music, is because once everybody finds out about it, it's not as fun anymore. You know what? Jazz Fest. Jazz Fest is still the way to do it. Even the yeah. even the fairground stuff at Jazz Fest is awesome and totally manageable because it's huge and then the best part of Jazz Fest is all the little after shows like all the shows at the um, clubs around and they mm -hmm. sell tickets like for the 2 a.m. show or whatever and then you just never know what's going to happen it'll just be like Mavis Beacon and Trombone Shorty dropped in and it'll just be this like nutso tiny little unbelievable yeah. show yeah Ooh, I, gotta, I gotta go to Jazz Fest you gotta go to Jazz Fest can we go to Jazz Fest let's go yes. to Jazz Fest let's do it I missed it Plans last year but I had gone the made. previous two years when is it it's in May. From May. It's it, there's two weekends, like the the end. Of, I always go the second weekend, but the end of April we go because I miss the Kentucky Derby every year, which I also want to do. But I think I have to go to Jazz Fest. Let's go to Jazz Fest. We're we going to Jazz Fest. We're going to Jazz Fest. What what, what what does it run like Thursday through Monday sort of thing? Yeah, DTS yeah. Jazz Fest. Two weekends so, in a in a row. SFJazzFest.org. Yeah. yeah. So we could do like a Friday show and then jazz it up. Yeah, Dude, it's South so amazing. South not South SF. Where did West. I get that? New Orleans Jazz Fest, not SF. Yeah, New Orleans. All right, hold on. I think I have to. I think my editor needs me. Patrick, Sorry. can you come? Oh wait, what? To Jazz Fest? Jazz Fest in New Orleans in May. Just I, say yes. I will Just... definitely for sure be there. Just ah. look for me in the crowd. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll meet you guys there. You guys, I have to go. I have to finish up and edit. I'm sorry. All right. Bye. Thanks, Molly. Oh. Bye. Right. Bye. Bye, Molly. Bye. Bye, Patrick. Nice to see you. Yay. Um, I really like Windows 9. 
as a title. <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm trying to bribe the chat room into into well, Windows eight, Ooh, nine, and ten is actually I, I like that one yeah. better yeah. because okay. Windows nine can sound like maybe you're anti Windows, but Windows eight, eight nine, ten yeah. saying no, there was no, there was Ooh. no nine. Okay. I actually like yeah. Windows I don't seven, know, eight, the, nine, the, but I. Okay. The, the the votes, thank you, chat room, are, are going for Windows 9. But <laughs> no, I think, <laughs> I think nine, uh, 8, 9, 10 works. As long what as there's think, some Jenny? German in there. Am I, I being oversensitive? Uh, as long as there's a joke about um, 9 in there somewhere, I think that's the winning conceptual vote of the day. So whichever one it ends <laughs> up being is fine by me. But I think it's Windows not by me, by the way, Windows 9. 10 really makes, yeah. the, makes the... I, I voted for that one. That's my favorite one. Yeah. And it no, makes no, sense, too. So. No offense to Patrick, but it's... Uh, <laughs> well, you know, I'm a little bit offended, that, but I'll survive. It has that ephemeral quality of something that is both funny and also completely true in, one, in mm. like five words. It is true. I think I'll, I'll keep Windows 9 for, for my show. Oh, there yes. you go. I'll, that I'm doing next go. week. Yeah. Because so your I'm audience good. doesn't care. <laughs> about care. being <laughs> insulting? <laughs> what? Your audience does not care. About Germans. I don't know. Oh, we do care oh, about boy. Germans. Believe me, we keep a very now close eye on those like, guys. Yeah, now we're getting into European geopolitical history and yeah. anger and I don't know. Everybody just needs to go have a beer. Um... <laughs> Let's see. I'll say it's Lorraine. Um, <laughs> am I? Uh, is my video or audio cutting off, or is it? Uh, You've had a couple off? of audio uh, dropouts. Okay. Not persistent. Uh, but yeah, a little bit yeah. here and there. Okay. All right. Okay. Anyway, uh, I'm going to jump off. Um, Tom, mm -hmm. I need your address because I'm going to be sending stuff. To okay. Your it's address. <laughs> <laughs> eleven eight seven zero Santa Monica Boulevard. Uh, but yeah, no. I'll, I'll, do you do you want my do you want the uh, company shipping address or do you want my home address? Oh well, I don't know which one I should send stuff to. I'll I'll talk by you know, big it is. you know those. All right. Oh okay. Uh, thank you, chat room. You have as always been a wonderful crowd that I enjoy very much. And uh, thank you for voting on my thing on Showbot. And uh, <laughs> thanks, Jenny. And Bye. Tom. Bye. 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 Done. Wait, done with what? Send him my addresses. Oh boy. I'm exporting right now. Okay. I'm exporting a massive headache. Don't don't well export it but don't let anyone else import it. Yeah. That would be Ebola. <laughs> that um, would be Ebola? No. Uh, we have our first official Ebola case in the United States. I saw. Which is finally. great because cable news was just running out of things to freak out about. Yeah. So now no, we I have know. that. Poor things. And heaven help us if cable news runs out of stuff to talk about. I know. Ooh, Wow. So now the four largest theater chains in the U.S. are not going to screen any day-and-date releases in their IMAX theaters. Yeah, they say so, that. They, this is well, going to be an interesting fight to watch because you got good. the Weinsteins on one side. Yeah, uh, wait. And, have you to, have, would, and you have Mark Tom, Cuban. Tom, Tom, it's Weinstein. Harvey okay. will come beat you in the face if you say his name wrong. Okay. <laughs> um, but yes. It is, uh, it is going to be interesting because the one person you don't ever want to get into a gigantic fight with is Harvey Weinstein. Like, that is, that is a serious fight to have, and it's good that he's the one that's going to have it. 
And you got Mark Cuban, uh, who owns the Landmark Theaters. Yeah, which is really interesting. So I don't know. This is a big fight, and I think... Uh, got it. I don't know. I think theater owners should just, like... Get with it. And then I can move to Montana. Why are you going to move? Oh, because then you, you'd get all yeah, your Yeah, once day and date releases of major motion pictures are available in VOD form for I don't even care how much money, then I get to move to Montana. Because there will be no benefit in being in a major city. Netflix must have written a pretty big chuck. But that's the thing, they kind of can. Because you know they knew a bunch of theaters were going to give them trouble about distribution. So they they must have figured that in. I think what they figured is they looked at Snowpiercer and saw that they can make that kind of money. Well, but that doesn't make sense to me because Snowpiercer was buy it on demand and Netflix mm -hmm. is saying it's free for all my subscribers. So Netflix just right. has to like pay out. It's not like they pay the more people watch it. So they just had to come up with a figure right. that the Weinsteins a, right. said uh, is is like, yeah, that, that'll that cover us. That's good exactly. enough. And then hopefully right. we can make a little more by making some on-demand available and, and getting into some theaters. But that's creating a second sustain, that's creating a sustainable business model for day and date releases, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. Which is like, okay, you know, and, and, you know, I, I, nobody's heard about whether this movie is going to be as good, but I don't believe Ang Lee is directing this one. So no, he's really, not. They very yeah. carefully don't mention the director in any of the stories that I've seen. So I think they're doing a, a smart thing with a movie like this. Is instead of spending all that money marketing a movie that hasn't been out for, what is it, 10 years? Like, I'm trying to remember when Crouching Tiger came out the first time December so 2000 instead of, instead of falling into the trap that Sin City did with a different time frame they're just going to embrace it and be get all this free press about being the first in a big fight with the theaters and it is such a Harvey move it's so smart well and don't forget Netflix dropped a fair amount of money promoing House of Cards so Netflix is probably going to drop quite a bit of money promoing this as well you know yeah. I would expect to see billboards for this just like I did House of Cards yeah. and Netflix Orange is the New Black smacked all over it Mm -hmm. It's going to be great. What I'm curious about with this story, to me, what's really interesting is how many theaters will they convince to be on board? Because right. the pitch is you can't see it in IMAX at home. And what they want to prove is you guys still have a model here, but you got to embrace it now, which is our experience is better. Our experience is the one you can't get at home. And mm -hmm. if you continue to compete on come here because it's the only place you're going to lose so how many theater owners can they convince of that and of the ones that they convince if, even if it's just cuban in the end uh you know how does that play out how does how, how successful does it end up being yeah i mean it's just a big it's a fight that like it's one of those fights that it always takes a big brawler to get into and it's it's a harvey fight um Oh, Metal Freak. What if it hurt? What if Netflix hurts the movie draft? Uh, I think that no matter what, uh, people will still go to the movies because not everybody has air conditioning and it gets really hot in most of the country during the summer. And I think that that, that is still going to win out every time. And also the movie draft is a relative concept. So someone can always win it. Yeah, that's. I think this is really interesting for the movie draft, right? Because let's say that that movie draft that movie comes up crouching tiger and you're like do i want that like how much it's not about will it make money it will make money in the theater as long as it's in some theaters it'll make money the question is how much should i spend on it how much will it make and that that's a total wild card mm -hmm. 
because there's no way a, an IMAX only like the only way you could figure out what an IMAX only release was is to go back in time and look at all those IMAX movies that they used to play in the science museums and see what those made like yeah I mean that's I don't think you can track that's it. still not it's not gonna it doesn't ever in, in a window of a movie release in between all these other big summer well actually it's it's August 28th so it's at the tail it's hoping to capitalize on the fact that by August 28th all the big movies that come out in IMAX are going to be over mm -hmm. so that's an interesting um that's another interesting choice. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Yeah, I would agree. Beatmaster, best Chris Evans ever in Beatmaster in a uh, Snowpiercer, very good movie. Even if it just it it did at the end sort of. Nah. Never mind. I was about to do a bad thing. I didn't do it. Okay. All right, I'm out of the post. All right. Done and done. Now, Yvette Nicole Brown is departing community. I seriously, I just can't keep up. I can't keep up. What? All right, thanks everybody for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye.